Welcome to the last time slot at Google I.O. Uh, I'm Nico. I'm glad you guys could make it. So did you have a good time so far? <laughs> Any favorite sessions so far? <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, I saw that too. I really like that. Um, yeah, so uh, you might have noticed it's kind of hard to get tickets for I.O. One of the easiest ways for me to get in was to give a talk. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, and it's very different to watch all the talks when you know you'll be talking later. So one thing I've been paying attention to a lot is what the presenters do with their hands, knowing that I have to do something with my hands. So all the professional presentation presenters uh, kind of did like this. I guess they read some book on body language and read that this means open and relaxed. And all the more engineering type of guys were like this. And then they did a stand in between. Um, and I guess my conclusion is talks are more fun if you don't pay attention to the hands of the presenters so much. So don't look at my hands. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about 3D graphics on Android. Um, Earlier this year, I ported Google Body to um, Android 3.0. And I'll just share my experiences there, I guess. So who here has seen Google Body? Well, quite a few. So for those who haven't, if you just do a web search for Google Body and pick the first hit on most search engines, you'll uh, go to this thing here, and um, it's basically a human anatomy app. Users call it like Google Earth for the body. So there's a 3D app of the human body. You can zoom in, pan around. There's a transparency slider on the left here where you can um, look at skeleton and whatnot. Um, so there's a search box up here where you can search for stuff. And you might not have known that the liver has kind of an interesting 3D structure from the back. Um, yeah, you can click on things to learn how they're called. So this is the colon. Uh, and that's basically Google Body. Uh, for April 1st, we had um, Google Cow, which was kind of popular. So it'll be a little while until it loads. So that's the same thing for a cow. Um, and this was pretty popular, so we left it in the app. Um, yeah, so that's Google Body. Um, so Google Body is uh, obviously a web app, it lives in the browser, and for 3D display it uses a technology that's pretty new that's called WebGL, which was also demoed in the keynote this morning and there were a few talks on that. Um, so there's um, no plugin or anything needed for that, you just need uh, a new browser. So for example, Chrome supports WebGL, Firefox 4 does, um, WebKit, which is the Safari pre-release version I guess, kind of. Um, supports WebGL. There's an Opera 11 preview that supports WebGL on Windows. Uh, but sadly, uh, the Android browser does not support WebGL yet. Um, yeah, so web, um, Google Body is a 20% project by about five people at Google. So Google has this uh, concept of 20% time. Uh, one day of the week, you can work on whatever you want, if you want. And they were, they were looking for someone to, to make Google Body happen on, um, on Android. Uh, so I figured, yeah, that sounds like fun. I'll do that. Um, and let me show you how it looks. So Google Body for tablets is uh, available in the market today. Um, so if you're wondering, if you're looking for something to do with you know, tablets, you can download this. And, uh, and it's basically the same thing. So there's a 3D view of a model that you can move around. You can zoom in, zoom out, look at different layers up here. Uh, you have a search box where you can, I don't know, let's search for skull. Oh, it's right there. Um, you can tap on things. So these things here are called teeth. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a fun bug uh, where I don't get, uh, I don't do modulo interpolation. So if you spin the model a bit and then click on the reset view button, it spins uh, a bit too often. Yeah, so that's basically Google Body um, for Android. The cow is not in there yet but it'll come eventually. Um, yeah, so that's what I did. And I'm currently, so this is, uh, right now, this is um, tablets, tablets only, and I'm currently working on getting this work on phones. Uh, and I'd like, just, like just to share my, my experience writing this a little bit. Um, yeah, so Google Body was released December 2010. Uh, I did the port 
after that, so they, they sent out a mail, is anyone interested in porting this to Android? And I was like, yeah, if nobody else signs up, sure, I'll do it. Um, and then they told me, uh, awesome, and we want this for tablets, and you have two weeks, and go. <laughs> um, and so my point is, um, I don't have a ton of Android experience. So I'm not on the Android team. What I'm saying is um, my personal opinion, not an official recommendation. Uh, it might be factually wrong. Parts are probably. And what I'm fo mostly focusing on is um, doing 3D graphics on Android. I kind of assume that you're somewhat familiar with Android. Who here knows what an, an activity is? Everyone? Awesome. Um, who here has used uh, OpenGL before in any, also most people, awesome. Who here has done OpenGL on Android? Okay, so not, not as many, that's perfect. So, um, so I think this talk is perfect for you if you have some experience with Android, some experience with OpenGL, but not so much with the, the combination. And if you're completely new to Android, um, I gave a version of this talk at the Game Developers Conference earlier this year, and if you just do a web search for GDC 2011 Android OpenGL, you'll find this page, which has a slightly more basic version of this talk with um, uglier slides. So yeah, Google Body for Android uh, is a native Java app, and it uses um, OpenGL ES 2.0 uh, for 3D display. So let's see what I'll be talking about. So I'll very quickly uh, tell you what OpenGL ES 2.0 is. Um, it's actually uh, faster than saying the whole word, uh, whole word OpenGL ES 2.0. Um, then I'll give you a very, very rough mental model of GPUs, um, tell you how to, uh, a few pitfalls with textures, a few best practices and pit pitfalls with um, geometry, i.e. Uh, that is uh, vertex buffers, uh, vertex buffer objects. Um, then I'll tell you quickly how to quickly get data into vertex buffer, uh, into, into byte buffers, which you need to upload them to the GPU. And then I'll say a few words about uh, performance tweaks. So OpenGL ES20. Uh, so I guess everyone here knows OpenGL. Um, it's like, looks like this, right? Looks familiar to anyone? Awesome. Um, so OpenGL is basically uh, the 3D API. Uh, there are implementations on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, many phones. Um, it's been around forever, so it's, a very, it's very versatile. Um, yeah, as I said, it's been around for a long time, so 20 years, I think. And it's accumulated some craft during that time, and they are currently cleaning that up, but um, by the time they wanted to do uh, 3D on phones, uh, OpenGL was kind of messy, so they decided to uh, release mostly a subset, OpenGL for embedded systems. That's what the ES stands for. And it's, uh, OpenGL ES is basically um, OpenGL with fewer functions. Uh, so they got rid of GL begin and uh, many other things. Um, and there are two versions of OpenGL ES1, uh, of OpenGL ES. OpenGL ES1 corresponds to um, OpenGL1, more or less, and it has a fixed function pipeline. So that means uh, every model you draw will do uh, vertex transform, band rasterization, some predefined lighting functions, and so on. And there's OpenGL ES2, which roughly corresponds to OpenGL2, which has uh, fully programmable vertex and fragment shaders and all that. Um, yeah, and then there's also yeah, and Android supports both OpenGL ES1 and OpenGL ES2. If you do a web search for Android OpenGL, uh, you'll find some official Android documentation that tells you, that proudly proclaims Android supports OpenGL ES1. And uh, that's factually not wrong, I guess, but it also supports OpenGL ES2, and that's what you want to use in practice. And they are in, the, in I think they're updating their documentation there, but they are not there yet. And just as an aside, WebGL is basically a JavaScript binding for OpenGL ES2.0. So in th theory, uh, mobile browsers could support WebGL in the future, but they don't yet. And uh, WebGL is uh, very exciting, um, but nothing that I'll talk about in this talk because uh, Body for Android doesn't use it. So as I said, I'm currently uh, porting Body to, to mobile phones, so I kind of need to decide which Android versions I want to support. If you're just writing a tablet app, you just support uh, Android 3.0, that's easy. Um, but for phones, you need to take a look at this chart, uh, which is at developer.android.com slash blah. Um, and basically, Android 1.5 and 1.6 are less than, uh, I think, are about 5% of the market share these days. So I don't think it's uh, really worth supporting. 
Um, Android 2.1 is, I think, about 24%, um, which is pretty sizable. Android 2.2 is at 65-ish percent, and uh, Android 2.3 is 4%, and that adds, adds up to about 100, I hope. So Android 2.1 um, is the, the first version of Android that supports OpenGL ES2, but only uh, in the native code, so there are no Java bindings, anything like that. Uh, so if you want to do OpenGL ES2.0 and support Android 2.1, you need to add your own Java bindings, which is not hard, but annoying. Um, and I personally haven't used Android 2.1 at all yet, um, so I won't say a lot about Android 2.1 or anything. <laughs> Android 2.2 is the first version that um, adds Java bindings for OpenGL ES2. So I think that's a reasonable lower bound, uh, at least for the first iteration of your, your project uh, to target. And it also added support for uh, compressed textures or added API support for compressed textures uh, and many other cool things. And finally, uh, Android 2.3, um, from an, a Java OpenGL perspective, added only bug fixes. If you're writing native code, uh, 2.3 added a lot of cool stuff. Um, but for uh, just graphics applications like Google Body, I think Java is um, fast enough. You're just pushing data to the graphics card anyway. And Java is kind of like the, the better paved way to write Android applications. So Google Body is written in Java. And um, my plan is to port it to 2.3 first, and then if stuff works there reasonably well, then get it working on 2.2, and maybe eventually on 2.1. Um, yeah, and I think on a known new project should use OpenGL ES1. Um, I think 90% of all phones support OpenGL ES 2.0. All new phones support it. And if you feel that you really want to support the last 10% that don't support OpenGL ES2, um, these phones are also, I guess, pretty slow, weak CPUs, weak RAM. So you probably are writing second low-res version of your app anyway. Um, yeah, so I think every new app should go OpenGL ES2. Um, so let's take a little look at how you actually do this. Um, so the, the, the class that does OpenGL rendering in Android is called GL Surface View. Um, and it's actually um, it's pretty easy to use in your activity and your, your on create method. You just create a GL surface view. Uh, then you say set EGL context client version 2 to inform the view that you want to use ES2.0, which has the, the programmable shaders and all that. And then you set a render object, which is uh, your own class that implements the um, GL surface view dot render interface. We'll get to that in a second. And then you also forward uh, on pause and on resume to the view so that uh, when your application goes in the background, it stops rendering and that stuff. Uh, so that's all you have to do in your activity. Then in your um, manifest, you just add uh, uses feature ES version 2.0, require true. And that way, the market knows that um, your application requires uh, OpenGL ES2, and it will only show it to phones that support that. And finally, you need to write your own little renderer. So if you're using OpenGL ES2, um, you call static functions on GL ES2.0. So I recommend doing an import static for everything in there. And then you can just do uh, normal OpenGL calls like you used to do that in other languages. So you don't have to do GL ES2.0 dot um, GL clear or whatever. You can just write GL clear. And this. Uh, interface has three methods. Uh, one is uh, on surface created, which is called uh, when your context is first created, and then a couple more times. We'll get to that in a second. And there's on draw frame, which is called every time your um, view should render. By default, this is called uh, 60 times per second, ideally. Um, but you can also tell the system to only draw your, your view on demand. And then there's on surface changed, which uh, is not very interesting in practice. Yeah, so um, I'd like to uh, do a tiny demo how this uh, looks in practice. Um, coworkers informed me that it's uh, too risky to do uh, to go switch back to Eclipse for demos, so I'll just do this right on my slide. Um, so in on surface created, we'll do um, real clear color. I uh, know nine some reddish shade of gray. Um, and also, also call the view to um, not draw at 60 frames per second, but only um, when needed. Uh, 
And in here, we'll just uh, clear the background. So, and if I click this Run button, uh, hopefully the code will be copied into some Java file in the background and then uploaded to the tablet. So it still says compiling, so it says uploading. Um, let's switch to the other box. Yeah, and now I just opened the, the IO OpenGL app. I switched slightly too slowly to see it starting. And that's our um, hardware accelerated uh, flashlight app. So mission accomplished. Um, yeah, no, yeah, just one frame because it's uh, wind dirty. All right, and yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's the the OpenGL Hello World, I guess, and that's about twenty lines. Not too bad. Um, so one cool thing thing that GL Surface View gives you is that it creates a dedicated renderer thread for you. Uh, all OpenGL stuff will execute on the renderer thread. Um, which means that if your UI thread is overloaded, you still have smooth rendering, and if your rendering is kind of slow, your app is still responsive to tab events and all that. Um, so one thing that you need to do every now and then is to uh, relay an event from the UI thread to the OpenGL thread, because both the UI thread, uh, both UI land and GL land are kind of single threaded, so every OpenGL call has to be done on the GL thread, every UI call has to be done on the UI thread. So for example, uh, on click, I guess that should be on touch or something like that. Uh, when on touch is called um, on your UI thread, you might want to tell the renderer to draw, I don't know, a particle system at the touch location or something. So you need to somehow relay the, the event from the UI thread to the renderer. So th the way you do is you just call .q event on the um, GL view and pass in a, a run number, and then this will, be call, ex this will be executed on the GL thread. Um, so if you want to, for example, you access item in here, uh, then Java has this uh, limitation that int has to be final, so you just put a final in there, and then you can just use item in here on the other thread. Uh, one little pitfall there is um, if, um, if you want to use a class that's passed in, for example, the touch event, and you just do final touch event event, and then use event down here, um, then by the time the, the jail thread executes the runnable, um, the UI thread has already reused the, the touch event up here, uh, changed it internally and passed it onto a different view, right? Because the UI thread uh, reuses objects, so that it doesn't allocate memory all that much. Um, so the touch event. So by the time your renderer looks at the touch event object, um, the data is all wrong for your view. So you should make a copy of all parameters and then have a final local variable and use that in the runnable. Um, the other direction from the renderer thread to the UI thread uh, isn't needed all that often. Uh, just for completeness, you can do activity dot run on UI thread and pass in a runnable, and then this is executed on the UI thread. Uh, in body, I use this for example when you touch um, muscles. Um, I need to see what muscle was tapped, and so I basically render the, all polygons in, in some made-up colors, and then I read the screen and see what color was below the finger, and then um, have a mapping from colors to objects and then tell the UI thread uh, this event, uh, this thing was touched. So yeah, um, use GL Surface View, my advice. Uh, this makes happy Android for that, which is, I guess, kind of like a gold star. Um, it's very easy to use. It gives you a dedicated renderer thread for free, uh, and it's uh, very well tested. So some people on the internet recommend that you run your own little um, Surface holder thing for example, Chris Pritt, who talked here earlier today, uh, has an open source game called Replica Island, and he has his own uh, GL Surface View fork. Uh, and he has a one screen full, full of comment on about something that went wrong, like some, uh, some, a few graphic drivers misbehaved uh, under very specific circumstances, and he took him two weeks to track that down. Uh, so don't be Chris Pritt. <laughs> um, use GL Surface View. A uh, little word of warning, though. Uh, GL Surface View loses its OpenGL context very often. So every time you call on pause, uh, it'll forget all, uh, all OpenGL state, like uploaded textures and so on. Uh, so it'll call on create on your, uh, on your renderer object. And then you need to re-upload all textures and so on. And that can be slow. So uh, make that fast. 
Uh, if you're targeting three years or later, you can call set preserve EGL context on pause. Um, but if your device supports only one OpenGL context and the user switches to another app that uses OpenGL and he switches back to your app, then uh, your stuff is gone anyway. So make loading your data fast is the, the lesson here, I guess. All right, so that's uh, basically the, the OpenGL hello world. Um, here's a very high level picture about uh, how, how GPUs work. Um, so up there, there's the CPU, which uh, um, executes your Java code. And then there's this uh, OpenGL API where all the data that needs to be rendered is, needs to be pushed through. Uh, and then the data ends up in graphics memory here. And then the GPU uh, reads the vertex data there, runs vertex shaders, uh, rasterizes all the varyings, sends them to the fragment processor, which uh, runs all your fragment shaders. And that's written to the frame buffer. Um, so yeah, as I said, this is very simplistic. There's no blending stage in here. Some, on some GPUs, uh, the vertex processors and fragment processors are executed on the same silicon, and this is shared. But basically, uh, my point is um, you want to send not a lot of data over this um, bus because that's uh, very slow. Um, and also, many GPUs uh, cache vertex data, pre-transform, post-transform, they cache textures, and so on. So you, uh, to make these caches efficient, you also want to keep your data very small. So, um, yeah, and that's basically how GPUs work, um, now you know. And my point uh, basically is uh, don't send lots of data to the GPU on every frame. And if you do, then uh, don't do it in many small calls, just do big bursty calls. Um, so here's a, a piece of OpenGL 101 that I think everyone knows. Um, if you do GL text image 2D with a texture data at the end, um, and then to basically set the current texture, and then you draw your model, then this will upload the, the current texture every frame. And that's expensive, so uh, don't do that. Um, Instead, in your on-surface created method, um, you cre create an, an identifier for the texture, which is just an int. You tell OpenGL, um, make this, make texture, I don't know, number five current, then you upload the data once into texture number five. And then in your on-draw method, you just um, bind texture number five once, and then you call draw model. So everybody knows that. Um, I'm saying this because there's uh, nearly the same is true for vertex buffer objects later, and um, it's not as well known there. Um, you should also use uh, texture compression. So ETC, um, which is short for Ericsson Texture Compression. So what the heading says is Ericsson texture use Ericsson Texture Compression for RGB texture compression. Um, that's uh, an extension to OpenGL ES2 that's supported on virtually all devices out there, or on all devices that I know of. Um, and if you use ETC, then every pixel needs only four bits effectively. So that's compared to 16 bits per pixel. That's uh, 75% memory win. And sadly, uh, I found this isn't documented very well, so I didn't know about this, so I launched Google Body without doing this, and then I read about this, uh, enabled texture compression, and that saved like 10 megabytes of RAM, which is quite a bit. Um, it's also, so there's this binary ETC1 tool in the Android SDK's tools folder that I didn't know about. Um, so. The first, when I used this the first time, I did a web search for ETC1 compression, and I found some binary on some Ericsson website that ran only on Windows, and it included source code that didn't build on uh, macOS, so I patched that and used this. Um, turns out there's a binary in the Android SDK. It's just nobody tells you, or nobody tell, told me at least. Um, and if you then add uh, support GL texture to your manifest, then the market knows um, about this. And, the Android is happy again, hooray. Um, yeah, and it's very easy to load textures. Um, so on your IO thread, you do just do etc1 util create texture and pass in an input stream. And then on your GL thread, you, which leads, this loads the, the texture into memory and then on your GL thread, you can upload this. So you never, obviously you never want to do IO on the UI thread or the GL thread uh, because IO can be uh, unpredictable and might just take uh, 100 milliseconds and you don't want your UI or your rendering to stutter so you should always have a dedicated UI thread. Um, one small word of warning, um, if the width or the height is not a multiple of four, um, then the PowerVR GPUs just display noise for your texture. Uh, so for example, PowerVR is used on the, the Nexus S, for example. 
Uh, in practice, that's not a huge problem because most textures are power of two sized anyway, and most powers of two are also multiples of four. And for head-up displays, you can just make your texture sizes a multiple of four. Just something to keep in mind. Okay, so now we know how to upload textures. Not the same for geometry. Um, so same thing for, as for textures. If you do GL vertex attrib pointer and pass the attrib data in the last parameter here, um, then this uploads all the vertex data to the GPU. And if you do this on every frame, then you're copying lots of data around, so don't do that. And this is for some reason less well known. Um, the OpenGL ES20 example in the Android SDK does this. Um, so don't look at that example. And I guess the excuse is um, OpenGL ES1 um, uh, only supported this way. And they ha haven't updated this since then, I guess. So instead, um, just like with textures, you create a num numeric ID, then you bind this. Um, so array buffer is used for um, attribute data, like positions, normals, texture coordinates. And then you do GL buffer data with your data. I mean, the same for the indices. Um, and then on, at draw time, you just bind the, the array buffer and the element array buffer. Um, and you pass a zero for the last parameter instead of data. And that's uh, way faster. So yeah, it's way faster. Um, so two things to, to keep in mind here. One is you need to have this attrib data and this index data somehow. Um, these, these need to be direct byte buffers, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. And then, uh, as I said, you can call GL vertex attrib pointer with a zero back here and GL draw elements with a zero back here. And if you run this on Froyo, um, you'll have, uh, your, your application will uh, crash. And the reason for that is that they forgot to add the, the bindings for these two method calls. Uh, so it compiles just fine, but at runtime, um, when Android tries to figure to, to call the C method that backs this OpenGL draw, it doesn't find anything, um, which is a bit annoying. Uh, but it's pretty easy to fix. You need you basically need to add your own bindings for these two functions, and that's uh, so. If you're familiar with the NDK, that's pretty easy. And if not, it's I guess kind of magic. Then you just copy paste this and are done. Uh, who here has used the the NDK? Not many people. Uh, okay. Yeah, so basically what you do is you, you create a normal Java class and then you put your method there, but instead of putting an implementation there, you put native in front. And this tells Java that uh, this method exists, that it takes these parameters, and that it should so look somewhere else for the implementation. It's not implemented in Java. Um, and the same for the other function that's missing. And then you do a system.load library down here in a static initializer. Um, and then this is something you write with the NDK. So in your, uh, you create a JNI subfolder in your project and you paste in this bit of code. So there's a function with this uh, weird naming convention, Java, com example, IO, GLS, duo fix, GL draw elements. And Java uses this function name to associate it with a class. So it starts with Java, then it has the, the package name, com.example.io, then it has the class name, and then it has the, the method name. And in here, you, you put the implementation of your method. So the first two parameters of JNI methods are always JN, JNIN and JClass C. Um, and then the rest are the, the parameters from the function. So this is um, int, 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 just like uh, here, int, 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 <laughs> only with a J in front. So JNI is Java native interface, which is basically the technology used to call C from Java. And then we just call the C function for GLDraw elements. Um, and exactly the same for um, vertex attrib pointer. And then you copy this uh, android.mk file, uh, put that also in your JNI folder, go into that folder, and then you call ndk build from the ndk, and we'll, this will create some library, and then you do a clean build in Eclipse, which will pick up that library and copy it into your APK, and then you can call gles 2 fix um, GL draw elements, and then it works on Froyo. All right, so uh, that's that. Uh, let me say a few words about filling direct byte buffers. Um, so direct byte buffers are the things that you pass to GL buffer data. Uh, and it's basically a, a block of raw C memory. So if you're not familiar with who here knows C, are this the same people who use the NDK? Roughly, yeah, no surprise. Um, so Java obviously has managed memory, uh, C doesn't. And in some JVMs, these memories live in different uh, 
areas, um, and OpenGL needs to have the raw C memory for some reason. Um, so yeah, so you just need to know you need to use static bytefs for that. Um, and it turns out doing element-wise access on these is uh, pretty slow. So you get an uh, direct byte buffer by doing byte buffer dot allocate direct and then some size. Um, and then if you want to load data from a resource into a direct byte buffer, don't just get the input stream and element-wise put stuff. Uh, basically, don't read one byte from the input stream and put it into the direct byte buffer. This is very slow for some reason. Behind the scenes, this has several method calls, one Jane, and IHOP, and so on. Uh, it's much better to do this in blocks. So in body, I think I use four kilobyte code blocks. Um, and this sped up loading by, I think, eight seconds. So it's still um, a bit slow, but it's done uh, in parallel, so that's fine. Um, and you can be, do even better than that um, if you're willing to, do, to make some compromises. Uh, so as you might know, um, APK files are just zip files. And um, you can, if you give your resources some, mat, some a few magic extensions, then your resources won't be compressed in the zip file. They will just be uncompressed, uh, an uncompressed part of the zip file somewhere. So for example, PNGs and JPEGs are compressed already, so they aren't recompressed again. Uh, and also the extension JET um, is one of these magic extensions. I have no idea what file format this actually is, but if I want to have a resource that's not compressed, I call it .jet and put it in my resource folder and then it's not compressed. And uh, the cool thing about uncompressed resources is that they are basically just a, a chunk of your APK file and you get a, can get a file handle to that. Um, so you can do get assets.openfd which gives you an asset file descriptor from which you can get a file input stream instead of just an input stream. And from a file input stream, you can then get a channel. And a channel, you can um, mmap. And mmap returns a map byte buffer, and map byte buffers are always direct. Uh, so in this case, no conversions at all have to be done. Uh, you can just use this and pass this to GL buffer data. And this is another 10x or so faster than the previous thing. Uh, so if you, you're willing to not compress your resources, uh, you can have really, really fast loading this way. Um, yeah. So a uh, small word of warning, uh, byte buffer dot allocate direct uh, allocates more memory than you tell it to. Um, so if you just do a tiny test program that does uh, byte buffer dot allocate direct with uh, 15 megabytes and then look at Lockhead, then Lockhead will tell you I failed to allocate 60 megabytes. So it over allocates by a factor of four. Uh, which is an Android bug that's being fixed, I think, but it's uh, not yet. Um, yeah, so keep your buffer small, I guess. Uh, in Google Body, if you look at the, the market page, there are two one-star comments that tell you this um, app is crash. Uh, it's, it's crap, it crashes all the time. Uh, and that was because of this bug. Uh, basically, when Body was loading and people pressed on the screen a lot of time, so um, as I said, to, to do touch detection, I basically render the whole scene into, into a back buffer. And um, I rendered, I created an off-screen buffer for the whole screen, which is um, about a million pixels, and then two bytes per pixel for color, two bytes per pixel for depth buffer, so that's about four megabytes. And uh, with over allocation by 4x, that's 15 megabytes. And if loading is going on in parallel, that's too much memory, so body crashed without of memory. And I fixed that by not rendering the whole back buffer into, not the whole screen into back buffer, but only the 20 by 20 pixels around the touch event. Yeah, so just something to keep in mind. And one thing that I also learned is that it's, uh, if you don't have many users and you get two one-star ratings, that really hurts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> used to have a 4.5 star average, and then it went down to tough times. Um, another pitfall, um, compressed files can be at most uh, one megabytes in uncompressed uh, on Android 2.2. And the reason that is, I guess, is because the Android guys uh, have a static buffer that's one megabyte that they use to uncompress in. And if the uncompressed size is larger than that, they uh, say, sorry, can't do that. Um, so the things you can do there are uh, split your files into one megabyte chunks, uh, which kind of sucks, so I wouldn't do that. Um, or you can basically use uncompressed resources. And then if you really need the compression, you can compress them yourself and uncompress them yourself. And you can be smarter than the Android guys um, and use, uh, yeah. I guess, I hope everybody knows how to write a decompressor or uh, how to use Zlib, which does the decompression for you. But don't have a static 
max size buffer. So they fixed that in 2.3. Um, all right, and that's that about um, byte buffers. So the, that's already the last section, uh, doing fantastic on time. Uh, so I'd like to say a few words about performance here. Um, first word is uh, measure. So if you're trying to do performance improvements, uh, always measure if they actually help, and if they don't, then uh, don't do them. And I have a, a little demo for that. Um, about a little uh, pitfall, I guess, when you're measuring performance that I found. So um, this little program here uh, basically just draws, uh, just clears the, the color and the depth buffer seven times per frame, which is obviously not a very useful thing to do, but it's interesting for, for measuring performance. As you might know, our tablets are fill rate limited, and this can give you an idea of uh, how much fill rate you can get in the best case. So it turns out uh, seven, uh, clear screens um, is the upper bound you can do to still get 60 frames. So if you draw every pixel seven times per frame, you won't, probably won't get 60 frames per second. Uh, and yeah, and that's with uh, the cheapest filling possible, right? Normally you'd also do some, some geometry transforms and whatnot. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so I was uh, interested in finding out what this number here is, so I, I wrote this program. Um, and let's, let's run this. So what this will do, it will, again, compile the thing um, and upload it to the device. The device will measure how fast it's drawing and send that back to the laptop, and it will hopefully show up here on screen. Um, and for demonstration purposes, the app currently um, measures the frame time every frame and sends it. So normally you'd want to measure it for the last second and display an average for the last second. Um, but if you do this for, for every frame, you'll see a curious thing. Uh, every frame either takes exactly 1 60th of a second or 1 30th of a second, right? So that uh, oscillates between 60 frames per second and 30 frames per second. Or if you think a milliseconds per frame is better, um, it's either, either 16 or 32 milliseconds per frame. And um, I'm not sure why that is exactly, but my theory is that um, the, uh, the, oh, gold star. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, someone uh, suggests it's the VSync. Um, so VSync is what the old tube monitors used, I guess. Um, yeah, so, so I guess there's some kind of double buffering going on, and the, the compositor that draws the Android interface um, basically only wants to render at 60 hertz. And if your frame takes just a millisecond longer than 60 milliseconds, then you need to wait for the next time. Um, Android allows you to paint. And this makes it kind of hard to um, do performance measurement, right? Because if you're just one millisecond too slow, then you pay another 60 milliseconds for your frame. Um, and that makes it hard to evaluate if any rendering changes actually buy your performance. And as it turns out, there's uh, some hack that happens to undo this effect somehow. So I guess it somehow uh, enables triple buffering, but I don't know what's going on there exactly. I uh, stumbled upon this. Um, and yeah, just so this hack is done by this function, which I'll show on the next slide. So if you um, do this call here, and now it's compiling again, uploading again. Um, and now you see that this is a pretty constant function, just a little bit about uh, over 60 milliseconds, which caused this jiggering. Um, so yeah, since I don't really know what this function does up there, I wouldn't recommend using it in your shipping application, but it's pretty useful for um, doing performance measurements, right? Um, yeah. And here's, uh, yeah, so I, I guess uh, double buffering is what, what's causing this somehow, but who knows? Um, so if you call uh, EGL, so, yeah, and you need to call um, some function that's not exposed through Java, so you need J and I again. Um, all this, this code is uh, uh, on some Google code site, and I'll post the link at the end so um, you can play with this at home. So if you call EGL surface attrib um, swap behavior buffer preserved, then this somehow magically disables um, something or enables something that allows you to do better performance measurements. Um, if you do a web search for a swap behavior, then I think there's one page that up on this, and this page tells you never use EGL buffer preserve because it makes things slow. Um, and I guess that's uh, true, but on some hardware, it allows you to, to, to do useful time measurements. 
if you run the same, so this is uh, on, on the Tegra 2 on, on tablets, I guess also on your, your Samsung that you got also use Tegra 2. Um, if you run this on a PowerVR GPU, um, it doesn't support this um, attribute and it just crashes. So it's uh, very dangerous but useful for measurement. All right, so, so measure your stuff. And now that we know how to measure, let's see how we can improve performance. Um, so here are the, the basics. Uh, you always want to use vertex buffer objects, so don't upload your vertex um, data every frame. Instead, uh, upload them into a VBO and then only upload the, the integer to OpenGL. Um, always use index geometry. So as, I, as most of you will know, when you render two triangles that are right next to each other, um, you basically first send these three vert vertices to the GPU and then these three vertices. And if you send the, the full vertices, then you're basically sending this and this vertex twice. And that's expensive, so in practice you usually um, have only sent indices. You say, uh, draw a triangle with vertex one, two, three, and then one, three, four. Um, and that way you only need to transfer the, transfer the index twice, which is almost always a win. Uh, so do that. Um, OpenGL gives you the, the flexibility to either uh, order your vertices by basically have one p um, chunk of memory where all the vertex positions are, then another chunk of memory where all the normals are, another chunk where all the texture coordinates are. Um, but uh, don't do that. Um, you should always keep one vertex in a small contained um, element of memory, so you want to have vertex position right next to normal and texture coordinate. And then, as I said, there are many caches uh, on some of the GPUs, so you want to keep your, your attributes small. So for normals, you can usually get away with uh, just a signed uh, U8, so a signed byte. It's usually enough resolution for a normal. Uh, for texture coordinates, you might get away with half loads. So half loads are not officially supported by ES20, but like um, ETC textures, they are supported virtually everywhere, so um, think about doing this. Also, since uh, your code will run on different devices with different frame rates, you should uh, do you make your animation time-based, not frame rate-based. So um, if you have some animation and some device renders your app at 30 frames and the next at 60 frames, the, app, the animation should take the same length and not be twice as fast just because the device renders twice as fast. So uh, that's the, the, the basics, basically. And now, once you've written your app, um, and it's kind of slow. The first thing you do is um, you set the GLV port to a one by one pixel thingy. Um, and then either frame rate goes, goes up or it doesn't. Um, if it does go up, then uh, you're either fragment processor bound or uh, texture fetch bound. Um, so, and you differentiate that by making all your textures really small and if stuff um, gets uh, if that doesn't help, then your fragment processor bound, and if that helps, your texture bound. So if your fragment processor bound, um, yeah, there are a few things you can do. You can move work from the fragment shader to the vertex shader. Uh, in my experience, fragment shaders on mobile devices have to be like one or two lines, so you can't do lots of fancy effects there. If you want to do very fancy lighting, you can um, write all your, you can basically pre-compute all your lighting formulas, put the results in a texture, and then do a texture lookup instead of doing your own calculations. Uh, yeah, you shouldn't draw um, back-facing um, triangles that face um, the other way. And you shouldn't use uh, discard in your fragment shaders. Um, yeah, but the, the main point is do less work in your fragment shaders here. Um, if your texture fetch bound, uh, if you haven't, if you're not using texture compression yet, uh, you should. One thing that also helps is to use MIP maps because um, uh, because of cache cache coherency, and you can of course use uh, smaller textures. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention on the ETC slide, um, on the, the texture compression slide, is uh, that ETC doesn't support an alpha channel. So if you have textures that use an alpha channel, um, then there's not a single compressed texture format that supports that, that works on all devices. So in that case, uh, you probably have to download the, the right complex, compressed textures on, on first run, depending on the device type. Or if you don't have many alpha textures, not use compression. But if, you, if you're running into this problem and you, not all your te um, textures are compressed, then try that first. So if you're not um, fragment processor bound, you're probably a vertex processor bound. 
So if using a very small viewport doesn't really help you, you're probably vertex processor bound. In that case, um, use fewer or smaller attributes, so try using uh, signed bytes for your normals and so on. Uh, you can play with the precision framework, uh, precision keyword in OpenGL ES. Um, you can do, instead of doing lighting uh, per vertex, uh, instead of transforming the, the light vector into um, model space at every vertex, you can uh, instead transform the, the light vector once and then use, read the transformed light vector. You can use level of detail um, and you can cull objects that are outside of the viewport. So that's all the, the, I guess, pretty normal performance stuff that is also true on non-mobile devices. Finally, if you're CPU bound, um, then use less CPU. Um, so one thing that that's expensive, uh, can be expensive, is if you allocate memory a lot in your inner loops. In that case, uh, reuse memory. Um, batch draw calls, so don't, don't, have a view, uh, don't have a for loop in your draw method that basically tells the GPU, draw this triangle, now this, now this, now this, and loop for all triangles. Instead, have one call that batches all triangles. Um, yeah, and if, if all, fail, all else fails, you can look at the NDK and try to write uh, native code for your time-critical functions. In my experience, that doesn't help all that much. Um, yeah, and that's that, I think. So, uh, thanks for listening. Whoa. Watch me type my password. <laughs> um, so, code slides uh, and so on are available at this website. So if you do a web search for IO 2011 OpenGL Android, uh, it might show up. Uh, so the, the project used to be hidden earlier today. I don't know if it's visible now. Um, so we have these uh, feedback links that are completely uh, impossible to pronounce. Uh, so goo.gl slash t capital U M U four, if you want to tell me anything. Um, and that's that. And uh, I'll download a body for Android and play with it a little bit. So, do we have any questions? Thanks. Do you know how to do OpenGL to a widget? I don't. Okay. <laughs> I haven't looked at the widget stuff at all yet. Uh, aside from using uh, compressed textures, how, how can I speed up the process of re reloading uh, my textures when my, my surface is recreated? Uh, yeah, so do you do any, uh, how do you do the reading? Do you just use the ETC1 text util to read the texture or? I'm not using compressed textures. I'm running for uh, older versions of Android. Oh, yeah, so one thing uh, that I think might work uh, but with, which, which I want to do for body but haven't done yet, is basically um, you read all your texture data at uh, application startup once, and then you keep them uh, in, a, in memory cache uh, ready for upload. A memory cache? Yeah, basically you keep them around so you just, just uh, upload them immediately, and if, you, uh, if your activity is on low memory, it's called, you drop these caches, and then uh, basically you have them in memory already and you don't need to reload them. That's something I would try. I'd like to get some detail on that. Okay, uh, maybe later. Yes. Hi. Um, did you have any issues with uh, transparency? Because I know that it it uh, it looks like Body makes pretty heavy use of you know showing some kind of opaque model inside of a kind of a translucent shell, and in GL that that can be tricky to get order right. Uh, yeah. So that's a, a known known deficiency with OpenGL. So Body I think just doesn't care that much. Uh, so it doesn't look perfect, but looks good enough. I think um, they are so. Uh, basically, you can, so one, one thing you can use, so the, the, the usual way to do this is to draw your non-transparent stuff first and then um, basically sort your transparent polygons on the CPU and draw them back to front, but that's slow because you need to sort stuff. Uh, there's this uh, depth peeling technique by Cass Everett, um, that, but that needs, um, you need to render the scene multiple times for that. So I don't think there's a good general answer to that question. You need to see what works for your app. In body, I just don't really care at the moment. So what, what did you do for body? Did you just draw Oh, I just say uh, GL bend mode one uh, but, but, source of. But you drew the opaque part and then just. No, I just draw it. everything. Uh, so okay. yeah, so, so um, body has these, basically these layers. There's uh, organs, uh, skeleton, and so on. And 
uh, I draw the, the inner layer first and then the outer layer in transparent during the, the blend transition. But per layer, I just say transparency on and do, do your thing. And I think I draw the, the opaque things first, yeah. Cool. Yes? So have you, have you considered using something like BSP trees so that you can get the transparency right? Uh, yeah, I have considered it, but uh, it doesn't seem like the, the most critical thing I should be working on right now. So as I said, right, right, a, as a 20% thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, in your spare time, other than sleeping. <laughs> well, it's uh, my Friday, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I thought about that, but haven't do, done it yet. Yeah, I guess the question is, uh, it, do you see problems in, in trying to take that approach with Java on, on GL2.0? Uh, you know, are you going to get hung up on computation? Are you going to get hung up on pushing the indices through? Uh, try it, I guess. So uh, writing a demo for that should take maybe what, two hours, and then you know that's what I would do. But I, I don't know. So I guess if stuff turns out to be slow, you can always go to native code. Yeah. But it worked on really slow machines 12 years ago or even longer than that, so I guess it should work fine. Right. Have, you, have you considered or looked at render script, by the way? Uh, yeah, so uh, when I wrote this, uh, 3.0 was, there was even less documentation on render script than there is today. Uh, I think I had heard of the name, but nothing else, so not really. Okay. And also, I think render script is 3.0 only and yes. uh, Android only and so on. So I think uh, not, not yet. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, when you're using a GL Surface View and on top of which you uh, might want to use a, a Android 2D graphics uh, widget mm -hmm. or a list view, let's say, you know, the performance drops tremendously. I can understand there's like 2D computation and there's the 3D computation in the background happening. But like, have you guys thought about it? Like, how do you deal with this in the future? Um, so I'm I talking about a com combining 2D graphic APIs and 3D graphic. So uh, do you, uh, with you guys, do you mean uh, me, the Google body developer, or uh, us, the Android framework guys? Generally Android framework. Yeah, so I have no idea what the Android guys are doing. I'm sorry. Um, Any tips and tricks you might have seen that um, works? OK, uh, so I, I'm told to recommend the office hours. Um, so what Google body does, uh, so if you tap things, it draws these little um, text widgets, and I'm using OpenGL textures for that because I didn't want to deal with mixing 3D and 2D. But I think Google Maps puts 2D widgets on top of the map, and the map is a GL surface view, so it kind of works. So I guess it depends on if you're writing a game where you really, really need the 60 frames per second, and in that case, you don't want to put anything on top of a thing, or if you're writing an app, in that case, it might be fine. OK, thanks. More questions? I've got a question about the cow. Yes. Um, specifically, why are its teats on show compared to the female model? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I don't know. The, the, the web version did that. Um, I haven't ported the, the cow yet to the tablet version, um, so I haven't uh, looked into that yet. Though I can see the, the cow on the tablet being really useful. If you go to a steakhouse, you can be like, oh, I can, can I have this piece? Um, so that's my motivation there, but haven't had time yet. Hmm? What's that? Oh, yeah, that's pretty fancy, huh? So uh, locally on the notebook, there's a little uh, Go server running that basically, uh, so I have a WebSocket con connection to the local Go server, and then it copies that into a Java file, invokes um, and to compile this thing, then it invokes um, ADB to copy it over, and then ADB lockcat grabs the output for the frame stuff, sets it back over WebSocket. And, um, yeah, that's also on the, the slide project. And this took way longer to, to do that. <laughs> Than useful, but well. Uh, yeah, the the question was, uh, how did the run button work in the presentation? More questions. Go on, guys. We have five minutes left. No questions. All right, then. Thanks for listening again. Oh, there's one last question. Uh, in the fill rate example, you uh, you cleared both the color buffer mm -hmm. and the depth buffer, right? Yes. So, uh, I mean, if you uh, actually, uh, I was confused. Like, uh, uh, does the fill rate uh, work? I mean, were you trying to look for both depth and color buffer? Yeah. If you, so, if you just clear the color buffer, then uh, you can go higher than seven. So that's faster. If that's the question. Uh, okay. 
but you can just try it yourself. Is it? So. Okay, I mean, like, uh, depth buffer is like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you don't write to it uh, so often is what I thought. It's much smaller than the color buffer, so. Do I think, um, so the, the Tegra 2 has, uh, so usually use 16-bit uh, colors for performance for the color buffer, and the Tegra also only has 16-bit um, C buffer, so it's the same size. So it's bo both are similar? Okay. Both are 16-bit per pixel. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, phones actually have, uh, I guess, a 32-bit depth buffer per pixel, so you can get some Z fighting artifacts on Tegra if you're not careful. Right, then I'll just say thank you again, then usually someone Nearly. else pops yeah, up. It's not about the cow this time. Um, the question was, um, did you try the fill buffer test with textures as well and see what the throughput was in that? I think I did, and I think it was identical. It was lower than the seven per... Uh, I think it was... The there was no difference, so the fill rate is identical for texturing and also uniform color. I think so, yes. Interesting, thanks. Pretty sure I tried that. But uh, yeah, don't, don't believe me anything. Just uh, try everything yourself. It's uh, easy and quick to do. All right, and uh, that's all, folks. Thanks.